Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think it's still good morning. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, we are going to proceed with the uh, uh, next session. Uh, we have a keynote speaker. Um, she is from Houston, Miss Deborah Green. Uh, I would like to introduce her. Uh, we just talked. She actually went to our MSW degree program in Houston. She's very lively. You see her PowerPoint. Uh, just look at the cover. You'll be really amazed. <laughs> um, Deborah Green uh, is a service program administrator for DFPS Child Protective Services in Houston, Texas. She has over 30 years of experience in the field of child welfare. Currently, Deborah is responsible for administration, developing, directing, overseeing, and management of several regional child protection program areas, which includes family group decision making, family team meetings, family group conference, circles of support, preparation for adult living, education specialist, and that ICU conservative, conservatorship program, and et cetera, and so on and so forth. Additionally, there's a long list here. I'm going to protect it, OK? She's well, well known. I don't need to introduce her. Uh, I just want to make a quick uh, 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 announcement and help. Uh, that uh, Deborah published this uh, book and also this guideline is titled as Challenging Racial Disproportionality in Child Welfare, as well as Guideline for Cultural Competency in Rural Child Welfare. It's outstanding books. Uh, if you're interested in um, getting the book, go to the registration area, um, and then uh, she's av available for signing. Am I correct? After lunch. Am I correct? Oh, you didn't publish that one, but one. okay, the other one. But the Deborah Green is on this one. Um, she said she didn't publish this one. She's very honest, okay? <laughs> very nice, okay? <laughs> but this is available for purchase. Um, it happened, Alvin told me uh, he lost two books, uh, and someone walked out the book uh, 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 from the uh, registration areas. Uh, if you happen to have the books, uh, if you either bring them back or pay uh, $55 at the registration, I really appreciate that, okay? Without further introduction, I want to welcome Deborah to give a big uh, uh, welcome speech and also a, a, a before lunch speech. Let's give a big hand. Thank you, Deborah. Good morning. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'd also like to thank Alvin for inviting me to be with you today to present. This work is so very, very, very important. It is the heart of child welfare. It's the heart of social work. Looking and addressing the challenges and myths of disparities in child welfare through Pro -E, 4E programs. I just have to say that I'm also excited to be here because I automatically grew four inches. <laughs> I was so tickled because I came in a little bit early so I can make sure the PowerPoint works and everything. And so when I stood behind the podium, you would not have been able to see me. <laughs> so Alvin um, just quickly said, can you bring a little step stool for her so that we can see her? <laughs> because we're trying to tape. So I am also grateful to Alvin for allowing me to grow so quickly. <laughs> Today, we'll have an overview of child welfare disproportionality, disparities, myths, perception, challenges related to disparities in child welfare. We'll talk a little bit about the data. What does the data reflect? Talk about some of the effective and promising practices and interventions, and also training innovations that are going around. Looking at special population, and how many of you guys here like research? I love research. Well, there are some research opportunities out there as well. So we'll talk about what those are. The importance of incorporating disparities in the content of your work. When I look at this particular chart, one thing that always comes to mind is that a lot of times people use some of these terms race, ethnicity, and culture interchangeably. But regardless of your culture, regardless of your race, 
regardless of your ethnicity, each family is actually unique. They have unique needs. And so when we provide services to families, then we need to be able to address their unique needs. When we do not do that, then that results in disparities in the child welfare system. What is disparity and what is disproportionality? Before I give you a, a definition, because it's important that we do have a common definition, let's talk about that myth. Myth number one, disproportionality is overrepresentation. How many of you believe that? Well, actually, it's a myth, but it's a partial truth. So a partial truth sometimes can appear to be the whole truth, but the whole truth is that disproportionality is the overrepresentation as well as the underrepresentation of minority children in foster care under age 18. Now when we talk about disparities, we're talking more about inequitable treatment and or services of minority children as compared to those provided in similarly situated uh, situations when you look at Caucasian children. The word disproportionality is a mouthful, wouldn't you say that? I remember when that word came about uh, several years ago, people wanted to know where, in fact, Alvin wanted to know, is it possible for, we can coin, for us to coin another word? Alvin, I'm working on it. Myth two. Disproportionality is a black and white issue. How many people believe that? Well, it is a myth. It's not just a black and white issue. It impacts lots of families outside of African Americans. We have a growing number of African Americans who come into our system, and we do understand how that works. We've done a lot of study on that. We understand that at the back end of the system, African Americans are overrepresented in practically every locality. But it's not just African Americans. When you look at underrepresentation, wouldn't you consider that to be a problem also? Underrepresentation could point us in a direction to look at whether or not we are addressing cultures or particular population. When you look at the Hispanic community, then we have to think about migration. How does that come into play? How does that impact the way that we look at families and children? If you look at this chart, you'll see that 61% of the children are white or Anglo, and 40% are in care. 17% are Hispanic, and 20% in care. 15% African American, 30% in care. 3% Asian American, and 1% in care. 1% Indian, and 2% in care. But numbers are just only part of the story. Overrepresentation, uh, in terms of looking at the other side, there's a wonderful, amazing work that was completed by Monique Chung and Alicia LaChapelle. Now, this challenges us to look at cultural factors that could contribute or inhibit the occurrence of child abuse. When you think in terms of Asians, a lot of people think of them as the model minority. But what does that mean in terms of how we view them? How do we service what their needs are? Now, Mrs. Chung and La Chapelle will tell you that practices that we, we have practiced, the practices that we use currently may lead to child abuse being overlooked in Asian populations. There's some wonderful work that's being done by Alan Detloff. What he does is he explores the over and under representation of this particular popula population. When in terms of Hispanics, they are the, actually the largest and fastest growing minority population in the United States. Terry Cross has over 40 years of experience working with NICWA. Everyone knows about his work, it's well known, and he really takes a, a really in-depth look at the linkages between poverty, race, worker perceptions, and other biases. 
So he shares his lessons learned from the transition from apartheid to the majority rule in South Africa. What he talks about in his article is an actual practice that's taken from apartheid, and it's called touch tones. And what that really is about is about forgiveness, having a conversation. It's about truth, and it's about reconciliation. Disproportionality in and of itself, and this is very important and a critical point, is not evidence of disparity or discrimination. Actually, it is an indicator of larger issues, and it's a pointer and perhaps a direction that we need to look in. But when we're looking at overrepresentation or underrepresentation, we have to look at the whole system. We have to look at factors that are outside of child welfare, as well as the, as the factors that are inside of child welfare. We see some discrimination in various areas, but that may not be the entire story, because it is more about, not so much about discrimination, but it's more about what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about the children that are waiting in the system? It's important also as well to talk about measures. There are certain things that we are using to look at disproportionality, AFCARs, uh, the U United States Census Bureau, and also throughout different states and localities, there are reporting systems. All of these things have to look at individuals according to race, but not just race, because that's just part of the equation, but looking at the culture and the practices. There's a disparity index, and this compares involvement in child welfare of specific populations with the involvement of other populations. Again, this effort is to measure disproportionality over a time length. In Children Ever in Care, it's an examination of cumulative disproportionality. What happens after a case is in the system for a long period of time, and over a lifetime, how can you look at that particular model and, in, and determine whether or not that impact needs further addressing? The racial geography of child welfare. Now, this is very, very, a very interesting study because it looks at the complexity of child welfare's involvement in a single community. But the thing that's really great about it, it's from the perspective of the residents, not just the per perspective of the individuals who work within the system. We have to look at all of the various areas in order to be able to impact the system. If you're interested in measurement, Susan Wells has a wonderful work that talks about various definitions and how to calculate disproportionality. There's bias models, there's risk models, there's lots of things that we use in order to look at disproportionality. I wanted to talk a little bit about the national incident studies. There have been four. The first three indicated that there was no difference in African American families in terms of maltreatment. And so what that, those studies did actually, they indicated that race was a factor in how we work with families, how we work with youth, and how they move through our system. However, with the NIS-4, it did indicate that there is a statistical difference in rates that may be due to an artifact of the survey mythology and that there are notable differences. What does that mean to us? It means that we still have to dig a little bit deeper and we have to find out how that the numbers really impact what we do and how we work with youth and families. It just simply means that we need to take another step. But what it did show us as a result of interviewing community professionals, schools, hospitals, law enforcement, daycares, and a variety of others, including shelters, 
we found out that black children are 73 percent more likely than white children to suffer child abuse and neglect. Again, numbers are not the entire story. We have to look at not just who's counted, but who is not counted. For example, with the NIS, it does not count Native Americans. Perhaps the number is small, perhaps it has to do with us being able to have better systems. To understand disproportionality, we do have to take a look at the possibility of biases. With biases, you have to look internally, first of all, and how do you view, how do you view families? How do you, how do you view a race that's different than you're, you're on? And when we're working with families, when we're working with our staff, when we're working with students who have to go into the field, we have to prepare them for the field in which they're going in. They have to understand the cultural differences and how that, and their own cultural biases and how that could impact case decisions. When you utilize multiple public support systems, that could place minority children, especially poor African American children, in the pathway of child protective services. For example, a poor mother could not only utilize food stamps, but her child may be in special education. She may have to utilize, because she doesn't have proper insurance, the public health. At each point, it could increase her chances of being reported to child welfare. If a mother works and she leaves her child at home or leave children with other children, it's, it's inappropriate, but it's symptomatic of sometimes poverty. And so we have to look at what we can do to undergird families and youth so that the children are not removed, but that they can stay home and that the individuals, the staff people who are actually removing children and providing the casework services that they understand all of the different things that families and youth are going through. Models, when we're looking at various models, we have to determine whether or not the models themselves are bias free. We have to understand that there are various geographic areas and we have to take those into consideration. I talked about the numbers earlier, but that means that those numbers are national numbers. In some areas, you very well may find that Hispanics are overrepresented. So we have to really look at that uh, in accordance with geographic areas. Myth four, disproportionality can be solved if the caseworker is mandated to attend racism training. How many of you believe that racism training will help? Anybody? How many have been to undoing racism? It's, um, how many have been to the knowing who you are training? Well, those particular trainings are designed to help individuals look at themselves and then look at the practices. It's designed to be able to help us to work better with families and youth and prepare youth for the work that's ahead. Prepare families, prepare caseworkers for the work that's ahead. In order to do that, we have to look at systemic factors, agency factors, and family and community factors. The most important thing that we can do is to involve families. The reason that that's important because, is because the families need to inform how we work with them. Not only families, but youth as well. Family group decision making gives voice to families and it capitalizes on the strengths rather than scrutinizing deficits. There's lots going on all over. So some of the strategies to divert youth from uh, child protective services are the team decision making and family group decision making. In terms of collaboration, there's a, an area that looks at teamwork and services such as domestic violence, mental health services, substance abuse, 
services. These are very, very critical and important as long as they are meeting the needs of the family. In terms of the teamwork that's in the point of engagement model, the good thing about that is that both the caseworker as well as the individual who are making assessments go out together to look at the family, to examine the family, to try to make sure that the family is getting exactly what they need. Also, the referrals are linked to community-based services and alternative responses that are linked to family preservation services. We look at family members. We want to always view family members as the experts because family knows family better. We also need to think in terms of looking at the situations that families are in, and sometimes expediency is not always the best. We have to look at being able to match services with families. Believing, building, and becoming shields for families. This is being done in South Central uh, LA, where 54% of the community is Latino and 40% of African, is 40% African American population, but it has the highest unemployment and housing problems in the county. That really is a lot to say, but yet this particular service is very comprehensive in its delivery and it serves 3,000 families annually. What it does show is that the multidisciplinary assessment and treatment programs that they're working with really, really work. The results are very good. The services, it is important for us to offer services in the manner in which families need. So if a family speaks Spanish, we need to find either great translators or make sure that we have as many Spanish-speaking workers as we possibly can. I wanted to talk a little bit about the shift paradigm that's very, very important. When I began working with Child Protective Services over 30 years ago, we really were looking at rescuing the child. We saw parents as clients. We looked at the deficits as weaknesses. And we had cookie cutter type of services that we actually gave the family. Every family needed parenting, for example. And when we sat and we talked to families, we were more agency driven in our decision because I don't think that we were good listeners. We reacted more so than we responded. And in terms of the community, we consulted with the community, but we didn't have very many community-based services. We were looking at the quantity of services rather than the effectiveness of services. But now what we really have shifted to looking at empowering families we look at parents as partners. I've made it a practice within my program area that if I have a meeting, then I would like to bring in not only youth to talk to us, but parents to talk to us to inform the conversation, to make sure that we're on the right track. Because the important question is for the family to answer, how are we doing? What are we doing? Are we meeting your needs? So we have to look at the strengths that they have why? Because they made it before they ever came to our attention. So the workers of tomorrow need to be prepared for the families. They need to be prepared for the environment that they're going to go in. That's your job, and it's so critically, impor critically important. It is also our job. Maximizing meaningful engagement and shared decision-making with families. That is a part of what we do with families. It is something that all of the staff need to know it is something that is as you prepare the staff for tomorrow that they need to understand that when they're viewing safety permanency and well-being of children it needs to be within a cultural context safety first we understand that totally and completely no one can disagree with that if you see a child that's one years old that's in the street there's not one person here that would not run to that child to rescue the child and then you look for the mother to find out what happened with that situation. Does not mean that we're going to automatically remove, but it does mean that if a child is one years old, for example, and in the street, then there are some protective issues that need to be addressed. 
We cannot overlook the importance of involving the judicial system because it's so critically important. We do not do this work alone, neither do we do the work in vacuums. So if CPS makes a recommendation for a removal, we have to go to court. So we have to get the judicial system, the judges, all of the CASA, all of those individuals who also work with us, who join hands with us to be involved, to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we understand the families of today that we're working with, the families that are mobile, the families that are homeless, the families that cannot make ends meet because of poverty, and what their unique situations call for. I just like this slide. I just love it. I love it because it's, it's very interesting to me. Because when I look at this, and not just the caption, but I see a young person, and I think to myself, what does it mean? Does it mean that she's going someplace? Does it mean that she's leaving someplace? Does it mean that she's homeless? Does it mean that she's in college, but she just has to have a place to go, and sh that place that she's going is back to a foster parent because it's time for her to be in between classes because school is out? Or, this, or is this indeed a young person that's aged out of the CPS system with no place to go and with no support? and that everything that she has is in that bag. Well, we want to prepare the youth so that they, when they do age out of the system, that they do have support, and that this is a beginning to something great and not because they don't have any place to go. There are special populations that we need to really, really pay attention to, and those are the youth that are aging out of care. Those are the youth that are tomorrow. Those are the youth that will be in our colleges, and we want them to inform our system. Uh, it was interesting when the president talked about a young person that is going to U of H right now who's homeless. And I wonder to myself, is that young person, is that because he aged out of the Child Protective Services system? And what could we have done to help? Another area is communities of faith, kinship. It's very important. We have fostering connections that also helps with us getting um, family members to be licensed as foster parents to provide some type of income for them as they care for children. Now, you might think that that's a new idea, but it really isn't a new idea. But what's great about it is that it is now legislated. It is something that people have thought of for generations back. I can tell you that kinship works. The reason that I can tell you that kinship works is because I am an example of kinship. I was raised by my grandmother and by my brother. Actually, he was several years older than me, um, 11 years to be exact. I was nine years old, he was 11 years old when he took, I was nine years old and he was 21 years old when he took responsibility for me. Of course, he was very young, so when he got married, I got married. Uh, however, to be quite honest with you, that's an impossible task for a 21-year-old. So he couldn't do it. I was actually cared for by my grandmother and several uh, uncles and aunts. It made a very interesting childhood, to say the least. Areas for special research would be the American Indian population, we constantly need more work there, even though we have NICWA. Uh, we still are always looking for better and promising practices working with that group. The Latino and Hispanic areas, Asian Americans. And then we need to really think you know, outside of the box and outside of this whole area. Look at what they're doing in other areas, such as in Canada, to determine whether or not what they're doing there can inform what we're doing here. There is a need for successfully, culturally competent approaches at various stages of service delivery. We need to have more focused attention to special populations, such as children, for example, whose parents have been incarcerated, and those children that are 
the victims of child sex trafficking. There's a tremendous need for researchers to look at residential care. That area, we've not really addressed it as well as we should. So if anyone's interested in research, that would be a great area. Rural communities, we often overlook them. But there's a great community in Possum Trot, Texas, where there were two individuals who started what I would say a revolution, or others might say a miracle, because those two individuals decided that they were going to do something about the children that were in care. And as a result, a very small community began going through the Child Protective Services foster parents training. But not only that, they became adoptive parents. So a very small community began to become foster parents and resources for these youth who were troubled teens, youth who were from the inner cities. You would not think that that would be a good match. But if, I want to say, but if God had not touched the heart of the pastor and his wife to become foster parents and later on adoptive parents and start that revolution, we would have had a far number more kids still in care and poorly aging out of the system. So that's an area, the rule, that we really need to take more a look at. In African Americans in the United States, what Ruth McGraw might say is that we need to look at the adoption agencies. We need to hold them accountable for the effectiveness and how they are matching and making sure that we're meeting the needs of the children that are there that are waiting for adoption. In Child Protective Services in Texas, we have more African American children that are waiting for adoption. But in terms of the numbers, how are those kids faring out? How are we making sure that they are being adopted? And how are we holding the accountability factor uh, for those adoption agencies? But in order to do that, we really, really need to look at not just Child Protective Services, but we have to look at the mental health areas. We need to look at child welfare institutions, social work institutions, social work practices. We need to look at our court systems and all of the other areas that impact what we do each and every day. My colleague, she and I began talking. And I said to her, tell me what's your philosophy? I know that you've been doing this work for a while and I respect highly your opinion. And we began talking. She said, I only have a few minutes. But those few minutes were critical. And I appreciate her time because this is what she said to me. She said, time passes, whether we do something or do nothing at all. She said, we should build bridges that embrace the ethnicities, race, and cultures of society as a whole. She said we should not only do that, but that our future depends on it. Because the next generation of workers needs to be able to feel comfortable. They need to be encouraged to think outside of the box. So as she began to talk to me, she said what we, what we end up doing is we train workers. And we send them through the same type of training. We have students that come through 4E. But then because of our policy, our practices and our procedures, we reinvent the wheel and we place them in a box. So we need to encourage them and allow them, not just encourage them, to think outside of the box, to try new strategies and practices. I talked to my friend Dale Curry from Kent University and I said to him, I said, what do you think it would be important to talk about, to, to tell this audience? And I explained to him the audience. And I thought that what he said was very insightful and very important. He told me, he said, we must be careful not to view training as a substitute for necessary system program changes, that we need to look at education, we look at training professionals and development, and that these activities are very, very important, 
but it's just one component. He said to me that we need to promote cultural competency in order to address disparity. He said to me that we cannot do it in a vacuum and we cannot do it alone. He said to me it's a shared responsibility. He says this thing is bigger than Child Protective Services and it's bigger than education. He said to me that we need to engage and involve many into the solution of this process. And then he cautioned me and he said, but not without the voice of the families, not without the voice of the youth, not without those who are impacted most by the system that we have created. I wanted to take a look at as well to share a couple of core values that I thought that were relevant for this work. And these values are taken from the National Staff Development and Training Association, their code of ethics for training and development of professionals in human services. So core value number four, training and development in terms of professionals, we need to value diversity in our society and promote worker competence and understanding the uniqueness of individuals within their environments. And I want to take you back to the, one of the very first slides that I talked about earlier. When we're talking about disparities, we're talking about families. We're talking about all families. Families have unique differences and they have unique needs. And so it's important that our staff of tomorrow know that we cannot use cookie cutter approaches. That I cannot reiterate more often. That we really, really need to look at how we approach services to families. Where, not how, only how we approach them, but the, not just the acquisition of services, but where are the services located? Are they within the community? Are they outside of the community? Does the family have to cut, catch a bus in order to, and several buses in order to find the service that they need? Responsibilities as professionals. Our responsibility, what are our roles? Number six speaks to this. Training and development of professionals should incorporate strategies and or content to facilitate cultural comp uh, competence in all training. And I'd just like to add to that, we have to be careful that we always are looking at every stage of service, that we're looking at the entire picture as the family moves throughout the system. There's some interesting work that's being done by Barbie and Curry as well as the work that's done in Texas and a work that was recently published, the book that was alluded to earlier. Again, there's lots and lots of work. I remember in the beginning, if you Google disproportionality, it would not only come back as a word that was not spelled correctly, <laughs> but the computer just didn't recognize it. But now, if you Google disproportionality, it's something that you can find lots and lots of information on it. So at the back of the book, we do have resources related to specific populations as well. Ann Hilligenstein, the commissioner of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, gave me this quote. She said that Texas has worked for several years on promoting the strength of families and in keeping children safe and are recognizing that the family's culture can be a source of strength. She told me the story did not end there. She said that the story of Texas is a story of families, a story of outreach, a story of involving collaboration with community partners. And though Texas had been at the forefront of developing an understanding of the issue of disproportionate representation and outcomes for African American children in the child welfare system, it could not underscore the importance of working with families. She said, we had a lot of work to do. We've come a long way, but we have a lot of work to do. What I liked about our discussion is that she saw the issue as an issue that dealt with equity, equity of services, 
fairness, respect, and then she acknowledged that the work is very difficult. So why do we address disparities in child welfare? Why is it important? It's important because it's at the core of our work. It's at the core of social work. It's about strengthening and supporting families and protecting all children. And it's the central, most driving factor of society to care for children and to make sure that their needs are met. When we meet the needs of children and of families, then we improve the society in which we all live in. So your jobs are very, very important. It is to be able to make sure that our staff who are going into the field are well prepared for the families that they are going to be able to deal with. Now I talked a little bit earlier about the fact that every time that I talk, I want to be able to bring the voice of youth, the voice of families. Don't have very much time, but I would like to lastly show a quick vignette, and it's the voice of a youth. This youth's voice is, uh, her name is Whitney, and I may need a little bit of help. Okay. This is Whitney's story. I like to listen. I've learned a great deal from listening carefully. Most people never listen. I tell my story. It's what I do. I haven't always been heard, but I keep talking anyway. I entered the system as a baby. In kin care with Grandpa, he listened to my cries of hunger, tiredness, and took care of my dirty diapers. Back with my mom at age 11, I wrote a letter to child welfare. To whom it may concern, here is a list of reasons my siblings and I should be removed from our home. No response. So I wrote another letter. I went to school and met with my counselor daily. Help me, please, I need to be somewhere safe, I would say. But she couldn't make my house safe. I wrote more letters and slept on my friends' couches. Their parents would feed me, and then I would go back home, more worried about my little brother and sister than me, and I couldn't stay for long. The cycle would start again, Grandpa friends, back home, and more letters. Social workers did plenty of house visits. They interviewed us kids and checked in with my mom. One night, my parents had an argument over drugs. I could hear dressers crashing, then the front door open and close. From my window, I watched them walk down the street until they disappeared. My mother returned without my father. The scream was unforgettable. He had hung himself. Gone. I went to school the next day knowing that I needed to get out of my house. I stayed with a lady from my church and then with my older sister. Just a few months later, I looked out the window into the parking lot of our apartment building. I saw the coroner's van. It was the first time I'd seen one. I sat cross-legged on the porch and watched it like a movie. I knew that a kid from school lived there. He was an outcast who nobody ever talked to. He wore a trench coat and glasses. I had passed him in the counselor's office often. I guess we shared an interest in safety. Shot in the back in his sleep by his own mother, right before her own suicide. Luckily, Grandpa kept listening, listening to me, old and unable to hear. He smiled and nodded. His love for me is why I tell my story. It's what I do. That's Whitney's story. That's the reason that we're all here today. What I'd like to just end with is saying 
that I hope that we all listen. Just like we listen to Whitney, that we listen to families, we encourage our youth to talk, we allow them to talk. We encourage all the young people that are, are tomorrow that are going into child welfare practice that the one thing that they need to know is to be able to listen to families. Listen, in the same term, we should listen to students, we should listen to our families, and we should listen to each other. Thank you for your time. Thank you.